When the Sony FX3 first came out, a lot of the internet seemed a bit confused about who it was meant for. Like, what made it more than just a rehoused A7S III? Or why pay more than 500 bucks for a top handle? Was the lack of an EDF a deal breaker? For me though, as soon as the FX3 was announced, I knew I'd be picking it over any other mirrorless camera on the market, including the A7S III, and I ordered mine just a few weeks after it went on sale. Since then, I think it's had a bit of a PR boost of sorts, and all kinds of people in the film world like Danny Gibberts and Mark Bone are using them. And now that I've been using mine regularly for over a year, and especially since the much cheaper FX30 has come out, I figured I'd share my long-term thoughts and let you know whether or not the FX3 is still worth it at the end of 2022, or whether or not you should go for the FX30 instead. Instead. So who is this camera for and who would be better off with the FX30 or maybe something else entirely? What's good about it? And there's a lot to like. And what isn't so good? Would I buy it again for documentary filmmaking if I had a time machine? I'm going to talk about all of these things in today's video. And at the end, I'll weigh in on the accessories you'll need to really get the full potential out of this camera. Also, I'll go into whether or not I'd go with the FX3 or FX30 if I were buying again today. So let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth, and on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years of working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to hit the subscribe button because I've got new videos coming out every week. The first thing I'll say is that once I sat down to shoot this video, I immediately wished I had an FX30 because then I'd actually be able to hold the FX3 while I talk about it. But that's not gonna happen quite yet, so we're just gonna have to make do with a bunch of slow-mo cutaways instead. When I started making these YouTube videos, I didn't really think I'd possibly need more gear. But here we are again. Can we get serious now? This also isn't going to be a technical review because that's not really how I decide what cameras I use anyways. And high-end cameras from any manufacturer are all pretty amazing these days. I'm personally more interested in whether or not this is the kind of camera I can use out in the world to film a professional quality documentary for a paying client instead of analyzing what happens if I shoot this camera at 250,000 ISO or something. Someone like Gerald Undone or Philip Bloom could handle a technical review so much better than I could anyways. So I'm gonna leave that to the experts and stick to what I know, which is using this thing in the real world. Okay, so when the Sony FX3 was first announced, it seemed like not that many people online were excited about it. A lot of people seemed to be saying that they'd be going with the A7S III instead and that Sony had made a camera that no one wanted. But for me, it was the opposite. Finally, Sony had made a mirrorless camera that I could use for my professional work, and I ordered one as soon as I could. The few things it did differently than the a7S III were game changers for me. And even though the a7S III is an amazing camera, it would still be pretty inconvenient to use full time as a B cam like I do with my FX3 now. With that said, the FX3 isn't perfect, and I'm also gonna touch on a few things that drive me crazy about it, and whether or not the FX30 might be a better option. But first, let's start with the good stuff. Right off the bat, let's get the obvious out of the way, and that's the image quality to size ratio. Having a full frame camera as small as the FX3 that still shoots log footage with high dynamic range is huge. I'd still probably choose the FX9 for my A-cam because when you compare the footage side by side, I can definitely see a difference, but there are a lot of situations where bringing a camera like the FX9 can be more hassle than it's worth. Like maybe you're trying to shoot under the radar and don't want to attract uh, much attention, or if you're following someone up a mountain or through the jungle and you don't don't want to carry something that big, or maybe you have to shoot inside a car and hate constantly banging into the windows like I do. I also think at this point, it's no secret that the video quality coming out of these cameras is ridiculous. The files from the FX3 are beautiful, they're easy to grade, and they just look amazing. But honestly, that's sort of to be expected out of a top of the line mirrorless camera from pretty much any major manufacturer. I'm not a super technical reviewer though, and there are about a thousand videos already on YouTube that have gone over this camera in so much more detail than I can. So I'm not gonna talk about bit rates or sharpness tests or any of that. I really only wanna talk about my personal experience using it in the field. And I'll just say that you definitely aren't gonna be disappointed with the footage this camera shoots, especially given how much smaller it is than the FX9. Also for comparing the FX3 to the Super 35 FX30, I honestly doubt whether you'd really notice any difference in image quality other than the crop factor, unless maybe you put them side by side on the monitor, which I'd never do anyways. The depth of a full frame sensor is really nice to have and I really love the image quality, but it's hardly the most unique thing about the FX3 in my opinion. If you spend a few thousand dollars on a mirrorless camera these days, it's gonna look good. So there has to be more to it than a nice sensor. In documentary shooting, the images are super important, but it's audio that forms the backbone of your story. 
you don't have good audio, you are gonna have a very hard time making something more meaningful than just some slow motion B-roll layered over interviews. And for the most part, mirrorless cameras are an audio nightmare. Speaking of getting good audio, the sponsor of today's video is actually audio. But more on that later. On a normal shoot for me, I typically have a minimum of one character mic'd up at a time, and I also like to run the best possible shotgun mic I can for environmental sound. With the typical mirrorless like the A7S III or Canon R5, it isn't that easy to feed multiple channels into the camera at once. You can get an external recorder like a Zoom H6 or a mixer box that screws into the bottom, but they really just add bulk and more complicated workflows in post. The FX3 with two XLR ports and a 3.5 millimeter jack solves this problem and it makes it the first camera that I can really use to follow characters with audio coverage. I can't stress enough what a game changer this is for the way I work. Like I can mount a high-end shotgun and run a lab at the same time, both of which I can monitor through headphones using professional XLR ports. Most other mirrorless cameras out there can't do that natively, and it is a big part of the reason I chose this camera. I can't stress it enough, two-channel XLR audio is huge for professional work. If I need to cover more than one character, I can always put an internally recording lav mic on them, like a Tentacle Track E, and feed audio timecode to the camera through the 3.5 millimeter jack. And a little while ago, Sony also announced that they've released a dedicated timecode jam cable that should make this even easier. If you don't know what timecode is, I'll link to a super detailed Philip Bloom video in the description, but the short version is that it's a system for keeping different cameras and audio sources synced together so that they can all be easily matched up in post. Most other mirrorless cameras out there, at least the ones that I can think of, come with just one 3.5 mil jack. You can plug a Rode VideoMic Pro into or something, which is great for a lot of things, but if you wanna start working at a professional level, it's not quite enough, at least for how I work. If you're able to get the job done without having multiple audio options on your camera, that's great, and I'm not gonna try and tell you your gear isn't good enough or that you have to throw away your camera and get an FX3 to make good work. But audio is a big deal in documentary and the FX3 just does it better than the rest. The XLR ports are built into the top handle that ships with the camera and the handle itself has quickly become another thing I love about the FX3. Shooting with the top handle on a small camera like that helps so much for controlling jitters, getting low angles, and just generally carrying the camera around comfortably. For ages, I've been adding like small rig or wooden camera top handles to my mirrorless cameras, and they're good, but they're just held on with a thumb screw, and it's honestly not that secure of an attachment. The screws on the FX3 handles go right into the body of the camera, uh, in two places, and when you tighten it down, it's rock solid. I think Sony did a great job with the top handle, but I also have to say it's a little bit too small for my hands, and to make it perfect, I've added a cheap accessory uh, that I'll talk about later in the video. With all that said, the FX30 is also compatible with the same top handle, and if you end up deciding to go that route and save some money, I'd say the top handle would also be very necessary to add. So if you're comparing these two cameras and trying to figure out which one is right for you, I don't think either one has the advantage in the audio department, as long as you get the FX30 package that comes with the handle. While we're talking about sound, this seems like a good time to talk about audio, which is the sponsor of today's video. As a doc filmmaker, one of the challenges I'm constantly facing is finding good music for my edits, not to mention YouTube channel. I've used pretty much all of the major providers out there, so when Audio first reached out to me, I wasn't really sure why I'd think about using a new company, but I'm really glad I did. For starters, Audio's library is extremely well curated, which for me is huge. Some music and sound effects libraries out there are just so massive that when I'm trying to find things, I get lost and overwhelmed by the amount of choice. So rather than focus on pure quantity, Audio prioritizes quality so that you spend less time searching and more time just editing. I think there's something like 6,000 hand-picked music tracks to choose from and over 30,000 sound effects. Since the focus is on quality over quantity, like I said, it's gonna give you a ton of choice for your next project. The Audio Pro plan that I personally use covers me for any usage and it covers me forever, which is huge. As a filmmaker, I wanna be able to use a music service for all my projects from YouTube to big features without worrying about getting sued and audio is perfect for this. You're never gonna to have to read the fine print and figure out if you're actually allowed to use a track in the way you want because the Pro plan covers you for everything. And on top of that, and maybe most importantly, audio is a crazy good deal financially. Whenever I start hearing words like Pro thrown around, like Pro plan, I'm always a little suspicious about what it's gonna cost me, but audio is definitely the most competitively priced service out there. 
uh, that I know of at least. Seriously, if you sign up to the link in the description and use the code Luke70, you're gonna get 70% off, bringing the price down to under 60 bucks a year, which is just insane for a service like this. That's like a quarter of the price that I'm used to paying for audio services like this. So it's a really good deal that I'd suggest you take advantage of while you can, because I honestly can't imagine that they'll be able to keep the price that low for long, especially for new filmmakers and content creators getting high quality music and sound effects this cheaply is amazing. And if you do cancel down the road, you'll still get to keep what you've already used. Honestly, it's probably the best deal out there. And if you do need music and sound effects, whether you're a filmmaker or a YouTuber or a podcaster or whatever, so give it a try and use the code Luke70 for that ridiculous discount. The link will be in the description like always. And let's get back to the video. Apart from the ability to capture professional audio for the first time, the other major draw of the FX3 for me was the low light performance. In dock work, we often don't have the time to light locations, and so we have to shoot with whatever light is available. So by having the ability to shoot S-Log at a native ISO of 12,800, the FX3 opens up a bunch of options that aren't even available to me on my FX9, which tops out at a native ISO of 4,000. If you put a 1.4 prime lens on the FX3 and set it to 12,800, you can pretty much see in the dark and that's made some creative possibilities that never existed to me before. I absolutely love the low light performance of this camera and I would recommend it to anyone who shoots with available light. And this is one area where the FX3 looks like it has a major advantage over the FX30, which has a much lower native ISO range, which makes sense because of the smaller sensor size. Obviously a smaller sensor means less light hitting the pixels. The Sony website says the ISO on the FX30 goes up to 2500 natively, but I'm not quite sure if that's in all the picture profiles or if that goes higher in log. Let me know in the comments if you fully understand that one, but if it does only go up to 2500, that's a major difference between these two cameras and it's something I'd really think about. If you're gonna be doing a lot of natural light work in challenging conditions like I do, having that extra range might be super handy. Now, whether or not it's worth almost $2,000 is another question, but for me, I'm happy I've got the FX3 in this department. This generation of Sony cameras has also made massive progress in the battery life department. I remember shooting on the A7S II, which was really cutting edge for a long time, and we need to carry around six to 10 batteries just for a day of shooting. It seemed like you get about 20 minutes of battery out of one, and since I like to use mirrorless cameras as a B cam for interviews, this gets pretty inconvenient. The difference between the old batteries and these new FX3 batteries is insane. For the FX3, I only own four batteries, and even when I might have a two hour interview in the middle of a shoot, I've never managed to get through all of them in a day. For dock shooting, where you often have to wait to the end of a long day to recharge stuff, this is big. So well done Sony, these new batteries. Well, I guess they're not new anymore because the A7S III uses the same ones, but anyways, they're great. The FX30 is the same batteries though, so there's no advantage to the FX3 here. Lastly, let's talk about autofocus. Mirrorless cameras have had good autofocus for a while now, but the FX3 does an insanely good job in the right conditions. Now I'm not really saying, and I don't really have enough experience with other high-end options to say that the autofocus is better, but it works well enough that I don't even worry about watching it during interviews. Like I keep saying, I use it a lot as a B cam for interviews, and because I can trust the autofocus to just lock onto someone's eye and not lose it, it means I can just pay attention to the A cam and let the FX3 do its thing. But when I use it on a gimbal, the autofocus means I don't have to spend extra time setting up a wireless follow focus, and I can pretty much just tap the screen to lock focus and forget about it. With all that said, for most Verite shooting, I still much prefer a manual focus lens with a long focus throw, and I normally wouldn't ever cover a scene with autofocus, but for situations like I just described, it's pretty amazing. Pretty much every Sony camera out there from the 6500 up has good autofocus though, so I imagine the FX30 will also be a champ in this department, so I don't think there's much of a difference there. All right, so I know I just sort of fanboyed out on the FX3 for a while, but unfortunately it's not perfect and there are a few things that I really don't like about this camera. The first one has been the most annoying for me by far, and for some reason I never see anyone talking about it online. Now maybe that means there's something only wrong with my unit, but whenever I shoot the highest audio bit rate, which I think is 48 bit four channel, the clips won't play back with audio in anything else but the newest version of Adobe Premiere. If I open the shots in VLC or QuickTime or something, or just hitting the space bar on my Mac like I do with other video files, there's no sound and I get an error message about the codec. If I import them into Premiere, the audio works. Since I have Premiere and so does my editor, it's not the end of the world, but it does make it way more annoying to review footage on the go. And for a camera that I bought mostly because of its audio options, it is such a shame that this is an issue. I'm really curious if anyone else has this problem. So if you're an FX3 user, let me know in the comments if you've noticed this. Or if anyone from Sony is watching, please let me know why this is happening. It drives me crazy. Another thing I don't love is something I already touched on, and that's the length of the top handle. Now I do really like this handle, and like I said, it's one of the main selling points for me. 
It's about an inch and a half too short. And when you've got a large shotgun mic and a big lens on the camera, it can be hard to get the right center of balance. It's such a shame because Sony nailed it with this handle in pretty much every way, other than the fact that it's just a tiny bit too small. Luckily, there are cheap fixes for this, and that makes a nice segue into the accessories I'd personally recommend to get the most out of your FX3. The first one fixes this top handle length issue, and that's an extender. I use one from Condor Blue that I really love, and it works great. But I know Small Rig and probably other companies make ones that work just as well, I'm sure. It's super simple, just two screws and a piece of metal, and it extends the handle out to the length it should have been all along. I wish I didn't have to buy this thing, but at least there's a fix, and it costs less than 40 bucks. The next thing I'd add to this camera is a monitor of some kind. Now, the camera works just fine without it, but adding a five inch monitor really helps the odds that you don't go back to your computer and find out that all your best shots were slightly out of focus. I would also get the Sony timecode cable now that it's been released. I mean, if you don't do multicam shoots and you don't deal with multiple audio sources often, you can skip this, but for me, it's huge. Being able to feed timecode right into the camera means I can hand the FX3 off to a second camera operator while I shoot on the FX9, and I know that we're gonna be able to sync everything together in post without having to listen to that crazy screeching sound of audio timecode. It's cheap and it really improves the professional applications of the camera, so for me, it's a no-brainer. Finally, I suggest grabbing just one of the CF Express cards. These things are ridiculously overpriced in my opinion, so I personally wouldn't use them because you can pretty much shoot in every video format other than max quality 4K at 120 frames a second by using much cheaper V90 cards. But I do shoot in 120 from time to time and having to drop the image quality every time isn't ideal. But you just need one of these cards to be able to get the super slow motion you need without having to drop the codec down in quality. And I think one is more than enough. Don't buy five separate $400 cards when way cheaper ones will do unless you shoot a ton of slow-mo. So with all that said, would I still buy the FX3 if I could go back in time knowing what I know now or would I pick the FX30 instead? The short answer is yes. I think the FX3 is still pretty much the best mirrorless camera out there. And for someone like me who rents their gears to production companies, who are usually expecting to have the very best stuff out there, it makes sense for me to have the FX3. The amazing image quality, stellar low light performance, and most importantly, the ability to run professional audio via XLR ports all make it the top choice. Is it perfect? No. I've had a few gripes with it since I got it a year ago, mostly over that weird audio codec issue. But in general, I'm really glad I got it and I plan on keeping it for a long time. Time. When it comes to dock shooting, I would definitely recommend it over the A7S 3 or the equivalent from Canon or whoever any day of the week. And if you can swing this deep price tag, I think you'll love it too. But the FX30 gets us most of the way there for much, much cheaper. It's not full frame, but in good light, I doubt most people would be able to tell the difference. You also have the same audio options, assuming you get the handle, which means you can actually use it to follow characters around. The major disadvantage is its worst low light performance, but considering the Arri Alexa has a native ISO 800, I think, and they use it to shoot Blade Runner, it's not like it's gonna ruin your shot, especially if you get a decent prime lens as well. With all that in mind, if I were a new dock shooter just starting out, I think I'd probably go with the FX30. If you have the budget and you're doing lots of pay jobs, then for sure the FX3 is the better camera. In my situation, it makes sense and I'm happy I have it. But if I think back to where I was 10 years ago, I would have been much better off saving the 1500 bucks or whatever and investing in other stuff. For the price difference, you could get a Sigma art lens and a decent lavalier mic and still have some change left over. Even if the sensor is a bit smaller and the low light performance a bit worse, you're still gonna be able to do some amazing stuff with it. And most importantly, you'll be practicing your storytelling skills skills, which are the most important thing of all. All right, that's it for today's video. I hope you found it helpful to hear what I think of the FX3 after more than a year of heavy use. Maybe it helped you make your own decision about whether or not to pull the trigger on one for yourself, or if you should go for the FX30 instead. If you did like the video, think about subscribing so I can keep this channel going, or maybe watch this other video I made about five essential camera accessories for new filmmakers. See ya.